Okay, so now we're going to talk about bradycardias, and specifically bradycardia with a pulse. And here's the algorithm that comes from this, the circulation article. But this is what we're going to go over, really, how you go over these bradycardias. The first thing you want to do is make sure they really are bradycardic. And so bradycardia is now defined as less than 50 beats per minute, not our typical less than 60. And if there's another cause, you want to treat that. So you want to now if the patient is unstable, and they define unstable here, hypotensive, uh, altered mental status, shock, chest pain, or heart failure, then you're going to give them atropine. And if atropine doesn't work, you're going to give, do either transcutaneous pacing, dopamine, or epinephrine. If they are not unstable then you're just going to monitor and observe. Now, unstable does not mean the same thing as symptomatic. Symptomatic is meaning, you know, they might have symptoms. They might be short of breath. They might have some palpitations. But that is different than unstable. And the doses are here, and we're going to review all of this stuff in just a bit. Okay, so now we'll talk about bradycardias. All right, so let's say you got this patient sitting in the hospital bed and hooked up to the cardiac monitor. And you see this on the monitor. So the previous definition of bradycardia was any heart rate that was less than 60 beats per minute. But now we're going to change that. The new guidelines say it's going to be 50 beats per minute. Anything less than 50 beats per minute. And you, most patients anyway that are between 50 and 60 really aren't even symptomatic. Okay, now I said symptomatic, so what, is, what does that really mean? We should draw the distinction between symptomatic and unstable. So symptomatic patients, they might be uh, dizzy and lightheaded, they may be short of breath, or they may have palpitations. Unstable patients are really defined by those f features we talked about. They're going to have some sort of altered mental status, uh, chest pain, so I'm going to call that acute coronary syndrome type stuff, like unstable angina. They might be in acute heart failure or outright shock. They differentiate shock and hypotension, so I'm going to put, just put them both here together. So these symptomatic patients are really not in any imminent danger, whereas these unstable patients are, and so this is what we want to recognize. The other distinction that we want to make is we want to see if there's something else that might be causing their bradycardia. And another cause may be what is making their heart rate go slow. So they might be hypoxic or septic, in which case you want to treat those uh, processes first because that's the real reason their heart is going slow. So let's kind of go over that algorithm in a little bit more detail now. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that they really are bradycardic. And we had already defined that as a heart rate less than 50 beats per minute. And if they are, then we wanted to look for uh, an underlying cause. And that might be something like they, they're they hypoxic and they don't, or they don't have an airway. They may be volume depleted, in which case you want to give them some IV fluids. Check an EKG to see if there's either ischemia or other some, some other dysrhythmia that's causing it. And of course, you always want to put a patient on the monitor. And you'll see built in here is our famous ER mantra IV O2 monitor. After looking for the underlying causes, the next thing you want to do is see if the patient is unstable or not. And we already had a good definition of that, right? So they had to have altered mental status, maybe chest pain, acute heart failure, or shock. And if they don't have that, then you're just going to observe them and likely admit them to address the reason for the underlying bradycardia and maybe they need a pacer. However, if they are unstable, then the first drug we're wanna, gonna wanna give is atropine. And atropine can be given in doses of 0 0.5 milligrams every three to five minutes for a max of three milligrams. So that's a total of six doses. This is different than the way we used to do it in which you used to give uh, the first dose was a milligram and the second dose was 1.5 milligrams. Again, with a maximum of three, but if you followed that, you maxed out at 2.5. Now, if atropine doesn't work, then you got one of three choices of what you could do. Choice number one is transcutaneous pacing, or you can put them on a dopamine drip or an epi drip. Now, if this fails, then we're, then we're in trouble, and, and this patient's probably going to need to get a transvenous pacer, and so you're going to need to call cards as well.
So let's go over some of these drugs a little bit first. First, atropine. So atropine is an anticholinergic, and what it really does is temporize until they are able to get a pacemaker. And the dose that you're going to want to give for this is a half a milligram, Q3 to 5 minutes, with a max of 3 milligrams. So that's a total of like six doses you could give. Now dopamine is an alpha and a beta agonist. And at higher doses, the alpha is going to predominate, so you're going to get more vasoconstriction. At lower doses, the beta is going to predominate, and you're going to get more inotropy and increase in the heart rate. And the dose here is 2 to 10 micrograms per kilo per minute. Let me just say about a word about this vasoconstriction. For the most part, you're really not going to need the vasoconstrictive doses. In fact, if the patient's hypotensive, volume is most likely what you're going to need, unless, of course, the patient is septic or anaphylactic and you need to, uh, to get some squeeze of the peripheral circulation. Epinephrine is also a alpha and beta, but kind of equivalently. And so this is going to increase your heart rate and increase your blood pressure. And the dose is, again, 2 to 10 micrograms per minute. Okay, look here. This is 2 to 10 micrograms per kilo per minute, and this is 2 to 10 micrograms per minute. It's the same numbers, but there's going to be a little bit of a difference because of that per kilo. And just for comparison, let's look at a different drug that we used to use, isoproteranol. And this is predominantly beta with really no alpha. So with this, you're going to get mostly just an increase in the heart rate and maybe even a decrease in the blood pressure without that alpha peripheral vasoconstriction that you get with it. And guess what the dose is for this again? Same thing. 2 to 10 micrograms per minute. This 2 to 10 micrograms seems to be a running thread here. 2 to 10 for the isoproternal, 2 to 10 for the epi, and of course 2 to 10 micrograms per kilo per minute for the dopamine. Now let's talk about transcutaneous pacing. And what you're going to want to do with this is deliver current through the patient into the heart and hopefully get it to capture and then have the heart contract with that. And so in order to do that first you got to put pacer pads on the patient. And so the first pad you're going to put anteriorly just to the left of the sternum and then the other pads going to go on the back just to the left of the spine. And then you're going to want to set the pacer at about 80 beats per minute. The other dial that you could set is the milliampers. And so you're going to want to start that low and then just slowly crank it up until you get capture. And once you get capture, you're going to want to go 2 milliamps more or 10% more just to have a little bit of margin of error to make sure that you are able to uh, get capture. When you do, you're going to see on the monitor a, a short fat pacer spike and then your QRS afterwards. So this is shorter and fatter than the vasor spikes that we're used to seeing, which tend to look like this. And then the last thing let's look talk about since we're talking about bradycardias are some AV heart blocks. Let's just take a look at the conduction system again. So first I'll draw your SA node up here. And this is the AV node. So that's the bundle of His, AV node, SA node. And typically what happens is you have the SA node which fires and it'll send electrical activity down to the AV node. And there'll be a delay here before it fires and then it sends its signals down the conductive superhighways which takes the electrical signal to the heart. Okay, so let's first talk about first degree heart block. And with first degree heart block, you're just going to have a longer delay in the AV node. So the first degree block takes place in the AV node. And so you'll see a P, a really long PR interval, and then your QRS. And so this PR interval here will be greater than 200 milliseconds. And that's five boxes on the EKG. The next one we'll talk about is a second degree block. And this is, of course, broken down into two types. The first one is the Mobitz one, also known as Wenckebach. And here what you're going to see is that the Q 
QRS, I'm sorry, the PR interval get, eventually gets longer and longer. I'm going to exaggerate it here. With each subsequent beat until finally you just drop one. Let me mark the P's. And so you can see here that this PR interval got was here was about normal, got longer, got way longer, got longer, and then you drop one and then you start over. And this one again goes back to being short. So I like to think of it as getting the PR gets longer, longer, longer till you drop one. And the Mobitz one Wenke Bach is usually pretty benign. And that usually also takes place in the AV node. And a little bit of odd trivia, if you want, is that a Wenke Bach is actually pretty common in horses, and it's a sign of a fit horse. That has no clinical relevance, so if you want to forget that immediately, go for it. And the next one is called the Mobitz II, or I've heard it called the Hay, speaking of horses. And this usually takes place not in the AV node, but in this uh, bundle of hiss over here. And this is a problem because it rapidly progresses to third degree heart block. But let's take a look at what this looks like. And let me label the P's again here. So again, you do tend to drop beats like over here and over here. But what you're noticing is that the PR interval isn't getting progressively larger. And so instead you have a, you got two normally conducted beats, you drop the third one. Two normally conducted beats, you drop the third one. And so this usually takes place in that bundle of hiss and rapidly progresses to a third degree heart block. So this is worrisome. And we'll probably need a pacer. And the final one let's look at is the third degree heart block or a complete block. What happens with complete heart block is that the there is a disconnect here, either in the SA node or in this bundle here, such that none of these beats initiated from the SA node conduct through here. And so the AV node, it has its own inherent rhythm, so it'll eventually take over with its escape rhythm. And so you're going to see two separate rhythms, the SA beating to its own beat, the AV hears nothing from the SA, and so beats at its own beat. So if you were to do that, first let's draw the beats of the SA node, and you would follow that with the P waves, and the AV node would have its own beat, and that would look more like a normal QRS complex. And I'll draw that here. But it's going to be much slower than that, and completely unrelated to the... And you'll see the SA node marches out to its own beat, and the AV node marches out to its own beat. Now these are hand-drawn, so of course they're not perfectly in sync, but you would notice that this distance, this distance, this distance, and this distance were all the same. And then between the P's, that distance, that distance, that distance, that distance, all those were all the same. Now third degree heart block can be caused usually by, a, it could be caused by an inferior wall MI, fibrosis of the conduction system, or even Lyme disease. And the treatment for a complete heart block is to put in a dual chamber pacer. One that senses when the SA node fires, so, and when it senses that, it's going to send the signal down to the AV node or the ventricles to fire. So you need a dual chamber pacer. So that's it. That's our bradycardias. And mainly, let's review. You want to make sure if the patient really does have a bradycardia, we're defining that as less than 50 beats per minute. If they do, look for an underlying cause, and if they have one, treat one. Then, if they're unstable, and we define that specifically with these criteria, then you're going to treat them. If they're not unstable, then you observe them and you admit them. This is, of course, a bradycardia with a pulse. We went over pulseless arrest in the previous video. And how do you treat these unstable ones? With atropine, 0.5 milligrams Q3 to 5 minutes with a max of 3 milligrams. And if that doesn't work, well, then pick one of these things, either transcutaneous pacing, which we talked about here, dopamine, or epinephrine. And if that doesn't work, well, then it's time to get some more help. You're going to want to call a cardiologist, and you might want to put in a transvenous pacer. All right, next up, tachycardias.